Hiya, let's talk about another game. Enslaved Odyssey to the West is an action-adventure title developed by Ninja Theory in 2010 and later ported to PC. This was Ninja Theory in their Asian mythology phase, before they got into For Honor and ASMR or whatever. Before you point out that it's actually binaurals, let me just mention that I did say whatever, so we're all good. Odyssey to the West takes its name and some accoutrement from the very well-known Chinese folktale. Since you're watching a video, I can infer that you must have at least an eyeball, so you probably noticed that one on your own. I think we can all agree I must have written that while asleep. That probably goes for this whole video, actually. I'm not a fan of my current work. But the classical music is already going, and I took the time to put on pants, so let's just ride this one out, I guess. While I get stretched here, let me warn you, we're going spoilering. There's going to be a waiver and everything. Someone's going to die, or your money back. Enslaved gets going with the main character imprisoned on a plane, having experienced the title of the game in person. Presumably during his enslavening, his shirt and shoes were also enslaved, but by a different group with their own plane. Another prisoner decides against staying, so they hack up a quick escape. This character will be our tech whiz for the day, so what I'm about to say isn't surprising, but she gives the plane the willpower to start sporadically detonating. Temperature critical. Now that's not a dig, to be clear. By all means, speed along to the interesting stuff. Nobody wants a movie with five minutes of a person sitting in front of a screen where nothing happens. Well, okay, maybe me, but you don't want to take your cues from me? I just want weird stuff to happen on the screen, man, I'm bored. I'm just bringing the thing up because it stuck out to me as unintentionally funny how quick it happens. Like, y'all maybe think that I cut out some of it, but no. What I showed you is all the button presses. And with it... She deleted a super majority of the plane. Takes me more work than that to clear my browser history. We make an escape run through the plane as it tries to crash, which is now a, a really long process, by the way. And then execute an emergency landing. After we wake up, the escapee and, well, terrorist, based on her work history, explains that she gave us a little complimentary brain surgery, and it comes with a fetching tiara. So, okay, wait, I need to explain something. Um, during the plane run, we took a break to check in with the plane people, and it's revealed that these head things, they're all connected by computer. Uh, which, it probably has a lot of perks in the right, you know, circumstances. But, future rule by machines is not where you want a 5G cranium. That's a personal guarantee, son. So, we're trapped and obligated to help the girl, and if we disobey, things become very painful, or even lethal. I'm told that the marriage jokes write themselves, but I'm gonna be the selfish one here and just ask you to leave the rest of us in blissful ignorance of your personal misery. An aggressive violation of one's person forms the basis for a tentative bond between these two characters. The deal is, we help get her home, the jewelry comes off. The first few chapters are all about safely climbing through robot territory, so we can recover our motorbike from the plane wreckage and ride it to safety. It hums along at a good clip because it's not trying to cobble together a world or build a mythos. It's just a moment-to-moment -moment survival situation. I guess if you've seen robots take over one future and then riddle its corpse full of bullets, you've seen... Uh, robots do all of, uh, several you don't you don't need to see it too many m more more times I guess is what I'm saying so there's a lot of communication shorthand like this one subtle since the enemies are all automated this is carried by interactions to execute a story like that we got a pretty nice mocap and acting particularly by digitally generated life form Bilbo Baggins Man, I hope this joke offends somebody, otherwise it wasn't worth it. To be fair, I'm not really a acting connoisseur or whatever. I basically don't notice that people exist at all. But what I do notice in this game is body language and expression. This is an unusual level of expression, doubly so for 2010. Here's my favorite example, check this out. At one point, we find a closed ecosystem aquarium that survived the end, and it reminds the girl of home. And she's like, this gives me hope for the future. Can you read this face? Let me spell it out for you. It starts with B, and it rhymes with oven mitt. It's just one slave ship, and they caught a handful of us. Think more won't fall. Something I like a lot about this game is that it's clear that the tech support is not savvy with survival. She wouldn't survive on her own, and she knows it. Hence, the sexually tense hostage situation going on. It's a vulnerability that's congruent with computer superpowers. It keeps things grounded and relatable. I guess that stands to reason since Alex Garland, uh, the dude they got to help with the script, 
also wrote the film adaptation of Southern Reach, Annihilation. And that was 80% bananas by volume, but that managed to keep characters pretty grounded. Right, so we escape from, you know, New York, and find that the robots have enslaved the homestead. Damn. Shock. Then we get voluntold to help find the source of the robots and politely control C that bitch. So that's the first half of the game, as I said, emotionally focused, well written, I have no complaints. Here are my complaints. The polish that makes the story fun to watch isn't really present in the gameplay for me. There's a few reasons for that, but nobody wants to watch Spaz Borinsky's intro to Controller Calculus for 40 minutes, so let me sum it up for you in one word. Oh wait, no, no, I'll explain and you see if you can guess the word. This'll be fun. Okay, okay, how to start. Okay, let's go with the climbing. If I were a betting man, I'd have put good money on this game being compared to the first Prince of Persia. See, cause complex, roundabout parkour navigation is everywhere. It's only by the purely unknowable whims of chance that I would have lost this bet, I promise you. If people are okay comparing a game like Mars Warlogs, which has one barely useful gun and a budget you can find in your couch cushions, to Mass Effect, then comparing this game to Prince of Persia should be a layup on stilts. But a core part of what makes Prince of Persia navigation so fun is learning to read the environment. In that game, you learn the length of your jump. You choose from multiple paths, sometimes using the game's rewind mechanic to afford yourself some mistakes. In this game, the climbing is on rails. Other games of this type, you might be able to mistakenly jump stupid-wise, you know, exercise some curiosity. But the only input that will do anything for you here is the one that progresses you to the next ledge. You never learn the spacing of your jump in this game. Tapping A will either automatically nut tap physics on your behalf, or it won't do anything, because that's not where you were supposed to go. Later on, they add in what looks like timing, and I thought, oh, will I need to pay attention? Nope, not really. Combat has a similar issue. I noticed it right away, when I was swinging the big stick. It's the polished animations that give it away. Look, enemies recoil differently for different swings, where they crumple in reaction to the weapon collision. Now I think a lot about combat, you know, it's first on my mind, so right away, I'm thinking, animation for every swing, on every enemy, must be a small moveset. Correct. This is a straightforward beat-em-up, with no lock-on, meaning no directional inputs for additional moves, very little pushback from most enemies, and almost no variation in approach. You can solve every fight like a flowchart, where every step got an arrow, to any other step. Swing stick, maybe they block, maybe you use the guard break, maybe you don't bother. It's a good thing you don't really need to see what enemies are up to because the camera keeps getting closer and more sideways to give you the sense that your swings have a heavy impact. I've seen some people actually say that this gave them nausea, and I can believe it. If you had a cameraman leapfrog into your colon, you might get a stomachache too. You ready for the word? Oversimplified. Too oversimplified. For the people that want it in the form of a positive, your word is accessible. Too accessible. I don't want to say that it's just about hard. Challenge is way too wide a conversation for the scope of this space. It's complicated and subjective, and it's not like salt or butter. You don't just add more until you get something good. Being engaged doesn't mean you have to be clenching your whole butt. It just means you actually have your eyes on the game. Maybe you're thinking of different ways to play it, I don't know. Second half of the game revolves around hatching a scheme to break into robot territory and hijack a giant robot, and so you can, yeah, whatever. The ultimate reveal is kind of neat, though. Last chance for big spoils, by the way. Throughout the game, the headset is showing you glimpses of the past, which is a little unintentionally funny to me because it looks like you're being psychically attacked by a Facebook feed from one of the developer's vacations or something. So when you roll up on Computer Center, it turns out the headset is showing you a fabricated reality in which a computer architect preserves and protects people from the horror that is the outside world. And so Andy Serkis confronts the remnant cyborg intelligence. Andy Serkis. I just want to say at this point, I was like, yeah, this game is worth it for me. Andy Serkis humbly suggests that Andy Serkis have a look at the simulacrum that Andy Serkis so painstakingly created, and he kind of approves. Or he gets really high. But wait, maybe he's just been being brainwashed throughout the game, eh? Remember, in the beginning, when the main computer control all deleted that dude, because he wasn't supposed to talk to strangers? And so the girl, seeing clearly and also having beef with this dude because he crapped in her lawn and killed her dad, ends the slavery by giving people the gift of murder. I don't know, I found it satisfying. If you're ranking Journey to the West adaptations, it's, it's way better than Dragon Ball Evolution. But I'm psh. Actually, wait, this is true. While doing research on this, I did see one dude say that this is an embarrassment to fans of Journey to the West. 
I want to be as diplomatic as I possibly can on this. I've never seen these words in this order in my life. I think this probably counts as a statistical anomaly, like a rounding error of persons. I learned two things about Ninja Theory playing this game. First game of theirs I've played, actually. One, since way back when, their target has been immersive, high-quality storytelling. This is actually the second game Andy Serkis worked with them on. He was involved in Heavenly Sword as well. So, I mean, what they're doing now, which is really connecting with people who want that kind of experience, it looks like they're succeeding. Two, these dudes cannot design a boss fight. I think I have like five minutes of just stunning this thing and hitting it over and over. Bruh. This ain't the only thing that feels mechanical and joyless in this thing, actually. Like, maybe don't shuffle experience point pickups into, no exaggeration, all of the four corners of most areas. I'm not going to heal my way around every room I go into, okay? Put them on, like, some optional jumping tracks or something. Man, ain't y'all never played Mario? That does it for this time. Two months for 11 minutes of content. Nice. I don't know what's up next, but it better be cheap, that's all I know.